and I think we're all set there. We're going to go ahead and record. I want to welcome you, my friends, to Sanctuary Online. Um, it's, it's many of you may know us as Sanctuary in the Woods, but just like you, we had um, life was rolling along on uh, the first quarter of 2020. Things were going great. We had our engineers in. We were working with um, our lawyers, civil engineers, and suddenly COVID struck, right? And after um, sitting around and maybe sulking for a bit or like everybody else asking, what the heck does this mean to us? We kind of asked ourselves a few questions and we said, how do we still be sanctuary? Even with COVID, even with the physical restrictions, what might we do to you know, out live out our passion, which really is to bring um, programming, inspirational programming, important life giving programming, and maybe not at sanctuary since folks aren't going to be gathering for a while but how can we get that out online so again we always say a few bottles of water a few mugs of coffee and possibly a bit of wine and sanctuary online was born and so we hope to spend every tuesday night with whoever will show up and we said what can we use for topics who's our current audience and who's the wider audience that we wish to serve and finally, we asked ourselves, what are the questions people are asking right now? And that's how we started May 5th of putting some fabulous speakers who spoke about change management, which was what we're all still going through. We talked about mental health. We've talked about Black Lives Matter. We've done so much work. And we also want to make sure that we have some lighter evenings and some heavier evenings. So we're here every Tuesday night. And tonight, I cannot wait to introduce to you a giant in my life. Nancy, you have, um, my friend, I have quotes from you that have shifted my life, changed my life, given me life. And I know I'm one of many, you know, in the screen um, today. And for many of you, I know Nancy needs no introduction, but there's quite a few of you who are not from our MCC clan. And I want to share just a few things. And trust me, I had to pare down a bio that was pages and pages and pages long. Nancy served our denomination as moderator. She was the global leader of Metropolitan Community Church from 2005 to 2016. And Nancy found MCC just four years after it was founded. She has served churches in Boston, in Detroit, in Los Angeles, in Sarasota, Florida. And in 2011, President Barack Obama appointed Nancy to the President's Advisory Council on Faith-Based and Neighborhood Partnerships. Yes. And um, the work of that council culminated in a report of recommendations to the president called Building Partnerships to Eradicate Modern Day Slavery. Now, following President Obama's re-election in 2013, I think he had an affinity for you, Nancy. He asked you, and you gave a scripture reading at the inaugural prayer service at the National Cathedral in Washington, D.C. You were the first openly gay clergy member to participate in something like that. So another round of applause. Keep on going, folks. Um, Nancy, I, I, man, you have been an honoree, recognized at Intersections International for you, hu your humanitarian work. In honor of International Women's Day, you've been selected by the Huffington Post as one of the 50 most powerful religious um, leaders making change in the world. People, I could go on and on and on, but they never get to Nancy. So. I am going to just introduce you now, Nancy. I know that you currently serve um, as co-pastor with Vicki down at the Suncoast Cathedral and MCC in Venice, Florida. And let me tell you what, we are honored, honored, honored to have you here tonight. So could you all just give me, you could even unmute yourselves and give Nancy one of these. Come on, some sanctuary love. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Nancy. Now, um, as we begin, I'm going to, uh, Nancy, Nancy's longtime friend and assistant, Connie Meadows, just passed away a few days ago on July 20th. And just as when we um, had Sanctuary Online after Vicki had passed away, we just offered a moment of silence. So if you would just take a moment and you can just be in some quiet space and we will send love to Connie to her family, to her friends, so many that, that missed Connie. She was, again, an amazing character 
in the lives of, the, of those of us who were able, blessed to know her. <clears throat> Thank you so much. And Nancy, you wanted to open in prayer tonight. Yes. So I'm going to yes. toss this back over to you. Okay. Well, thank you all for coming and uh, for being interested in uh, birding. And I know some of you are probably better birders than I am and been at it longer than me. And uh, But this is a passion I have. And so it's a delight to share it, something like this in the middle of the times we're going through. So let's pray. God, we love you. And uh, we love the creation that surrounds us and nurtures us and sustains us. And we feel our kinship tonight with birds, uh, part of your delightful creation. And uh, we honor them as we share this time. In your many names we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Nancy. The floor is yours, my friend. Okay. So I want to say a little bit about how I got into birding. And um, birding is very intersectional for me. It connects me to my activism as a, a climate change activist, uh, as a feminist in, in so many different ways. Um, but I actually identified as a birder after a trip to Africa 20 years ago. Um, Paula was taking pictures of the large animals and we were on a safari and we had a wonderful guide. We had a wonderful guide who I can see hearing an echo, so, okay. So, uh, like Johnny Kamaguchi, who was our guide, uh, was a birder, and I was fascinated by what he did in terms of his skill in identifying birds and knowing so much about them. And so I began what felt like a learning process and a spiritual process in being connected to birds. Um, and in many ways, birds, birding saved my life because I became a birder really at the height of the AIDS epidemic, being a pastor of MCC Los Angeles, uh, and it was during my sabbatical, I finally got a sabbatical and rested after many years, decades of pastoring. And birding really brought me back to life. And one of the things that also did was connected me with me to my love of language and poetry. And so I have two poems to share tonight about birds. And here's the first one. And, you know, uh, I think birding helped me deal with grief. One was grief during the AIDS crisis, but also during the AIDS crisis and all of that, my father died. And so I began writing these poems that had something to do with birds and psalms. And so I would usually take a little psalm or a line from a psalm like this one, yours is the day, yours is also the night, establish the moon and sun, Psalm 74, verse 16. And here is the uh, poem. And I uh, I think I can see it all. Okay. So this is about my father who said, Daddy told me just say hi on the moon when you are far away and missing me. He meant on the full moon, the migrating one within me knows that. Just say hi on the moon. Beam me all your love and excuses, all your sorrow and fear, all your longings and wing weariness. You don't have to whistle. You don't have to howl. Just say hi with your heart on the moon. And um, so I began a process of connecting God and Psalms, and my own feelings of grief, wing weariness. <laughs> uh, and um, yeah. <laughs> so that's the poem I offered to you. Um, I think. When I think about birding as a spiritual practice, I think of these, these are uh, roseate spoonbills. If you live in Florida or on the Gulf Coast of the United States, you might see these gorgeous, luscious birds, I call them. Um, their beauty, they're kind of translucent pink wings and um, they have a little green on them and a little orange on their tails. They're just absolutely gorgeous. I think whenever we engage beauty, uh, especially the beauty of nature, um, we are somehow, our hearts and our lives are opened up um, to the reverence for life, for the variety, for the amazing behaviors of birds, for their song, um, for uh, the amazing ways in which 
some of them migrate around the whole circumference of the globe, uh, um, and, and how much their habitats and lives today are very much in danger because of the way the planet is heating up. Um, so uh, I, moving to Florida just increased my love for, for birds. I lived in California before that. And uh, whenever, wherever you live regionally, um, you know, you, you come to understand and appreciate uh, the power and beauty of local birds. Uh, one of the other birds, that's a picture I think here below it, is of the crested caracara. I think that's Char. Char's on the call tonight. It's her favorite bird. And this is a raptor that we see. I first saw it in Central America, but actually it lives, you can see it in parts of Texas. Well, if I do and that. Certainly in Florida, right? Uh, not far at all from where we live, just a couple of miles inward, inland in Florida, and you see these gorgeous raptors uh, that you don't see in most of the rest of the United States. Um, so I think about, when I think about birding and activism and spiritual practice, I think especially in these times, whether we're a layperson who is active in our churches or a pastor, or in what other ways, uh, we are hugely challenged right now by the very bizarre politics that we are experiencing, by the very dangerous times we are in politically in many ways, and of course by the pandemic that we are experiencing. And I do believe the wonderful thing about birding is that you can do it anywhere. You can do it right in your own backyard. There's wonderful city birding or country birding or suburban birding. Uh, birds live everywhere. If there's a little water, <laughs> um, there are birds. And so uh, you can do it you know, humbly on your front porch, uh, put up a bird feeder go to your local park or area or birding can be exotic and expensive i don't know if any of you saw the movie of uh, the big year anybody come on you saw the movie uh with steve martin and uh owen wilson and jack black and it's about people who uh, have you know there's a yearly contest of uh you know how many birds people can see and in fact i met the winner of that contest in Holland a few years ago. He took me on a personal birding tour. I didn't know that's who he was. I didn't know, uh, and he was just part of this outfit that gives birding tours to tourists. And uh, he saw almost 7,000 birds in one year, uh, traveling all around the world, it's a full-time job. And there are people who just, who do that, who, uh, you know, who are in, in that kind of level. And of course, uh, I neither have the time nor the money uh, nor maybe even maybe even the obsessiveness to uh, be that kind of birder. I think I'm a little more relaxed about it. But I think for me, the way that birding is spiritual is that when I am watching birds, trying to identify or appreciate birds that I identify easily, I cannot be thinking about anything else. I really cannot be doing anything else. And, you know, it, it's really about, um, I think, in emptying our minds of all the things that we are constantly thinking about or worrying about or the work we're doing, um, to be uh, in wonder and appreciation of birds is to be taken out of yourself and you know whatever hamsters are going around and around in your brain <laughs> and is to really be transported. I found that uh, first in Africa and then when I came back home to California and got some tutoring, you know, one of the great things about birding is that, um, you know, you can do it alone, you can learn on your own. There are great resources and books and bird guides and videos and everything else, but it's a great thing to do with someone else or another person. And especially if you're new at it, it's great to have a guide. And maybe it's a, a friend who's better than you are at it, or maybe it's someone who really is a guide. If you travel anywhere and do burden, always find a guide. And there are people who do it for free. 
uh, associated with birding organizations around the world who will meet you at any time, day and night, <laughs> and take you to their favorite birding spots. We've learned this uh, over time, that meeting amazing people, complete strangers, who have a love for birding and who will uh, take you on an adventure. It's kind of the Airbnb of birding, uh, <laughs> you know, that it's, it's a whole different way. Um, and I enjoy uh, being with people who maybe are just starting to bird and, and uh, who have been a little shy about it and uh, learning them to, helping them to gain confidence. And I'm also not ashamed to glom on to people who I know know more than me. I often do the Christmas bird count, for instance, in my area, because the people who really do and lead the Christmas bird count are really bird nerds. They really know their birds. And I always learn a tremendous amount by just going along on the Christmas bird count and, uh, and you know, maybe pretending I know more than I do, but other people certainly know more and are always willing to share. There is a, you know, birding community globally, uh, which is just an amazing thing to discover. And because I still traveled a lot in MCC when I became a birder, I got to learn that and know that. Um, Nancy, for some of us who've never had the um, Christmas birding as part of our family uh, tradition, Maybe right. you can share a little more about what that is. I saw a lot of yeah. smiles yeah. and questions up there on the face right. of the group. The, the Christmas bird count, I think it's the oldest uh, phenomenon of its kind in the world, over 100 years, maybe 105 by now, which was uh, early on as through the Audubon Society and other places, people, uh, amateurs are engaged all around the world to do a one day count of all the birds. And wow. so you you can just sign up and volunteer Christmas, you know, Google Christmas bird count in my neighborhood and there'll be a time and you'll be assigned perhaps a little neighborhood and a leader uh, and maybe there'll be two, three, four people, maybe more. And you have an area to cover and you cover as much of that area as you can and you count every bird, every kind there is. <laughs> <laughs> and um, do that for several hours yeah, and uh, then they you know total up and, and what happens is they see patterns changing in migration or where birds are or end up and and numbers you know where are the numbers growing or diminishing and it's, it's actually become a, a, a very important global phenomenon and uh, it's fun to do it's fun to do and it's Thank not you. always in Christmas. It's it's usually around the Christmas season, and so there'll be a two week period. And yeah, yeah. Well, Nancy, I also know we've got quite a few birders on here. As I look at the, sure. some of the folks that I know, and I know that you and I tried to ha say let's have a few breaks in your presentation for yeah. some questions. And I right. forgot to encourage or, you to load those questions into the chat box. And we've got right. some folks who are behind the scenes. I'll pick up your questions if you want to ask Nancy. But I wonder. Let's do it old fashioned. If somebody has a question, they'd like to engage Nancy about birds. If you just go ahead and raise your hand and unmute yourself, let's go back and forth a little bit since we have her here as our resource. Darcel, get, unmute yourself, my friend. Hi, Nancy. My question is, uh, what type of binoculars do you use? Yes. Well, when I left the LA church years ago, over 20 years ago now, they, about 20 years ago, they bought me a pair of Swarovskis. You know, they make the uh, jewelry, uh, cut crystal and, and glass. And, uh, you know, so I am fortunate. I have a pair of those and they're not inexpensive. They're expensive, but they will replace them. They have replaced almost all of my binoculars <laughs> over the years because I'm hard on inanimate objects. Um, and <laughs> so, you know, when you hike and you go, you know, whatever, but they have replaced them, replaced, cleaned them up for me. So they probably run, you know, probably now they'd run about $1,500, $1,800. Uh, and you can get, you know, inexpensive binoculars, you know, it depends on how much you can or want to invest. 
sometimes when I would travel, if I forgot my, I didn't want to bring my big or expensive binoculars. So I'd get a smaller little pair that I just bring that, um, or get somewhere that, you know, um, so, but the Swarovski, I, I really love, and it, it just has a wider, when you look in them, it, it gives you a, a wider field of vision. And I really like that. And it also, it works very close up and very far away. Um, that's, uh, I am not a technical person around uh, binoculars, but that's my experience is that uh, for me, a nearsighted person, you don't even need glasses. I can, you know, adjust them. So I don't even need wear, wear glasses when I use them. They're just great. Nancy, could you spell that for me? I'll put that in the chat room for everybody. S S W A R S W A R K O. Is it V? S K I, I think, or Y. Does anybody know if it ends in a Y or I? I think Y. I want to say that. Swarovski. There. So that's Swar a Swarovski. Swarovski. Oh, Mom, there's your Christmas present. Okay, we'll mm. put that on your Christmas list. Right. A really nice pair of binocs. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Nancy, they are really nice. from just outside of Sanctuary in the Woods, Ellen uh, just is the most amazing photographer, and she oh. often does, what, is it, uh, it's, um, what do you call it, Ellen? You call it something from the back porch, your time with nature in the back porch, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Nature from a deck. Nature from a deck. Nature from a deck, yeah. yeah great yeah. photographer. Um, well, Ellen, go ahead, if you've got a question for Nancy. Yeah, I was just wondering, actually I have two questions. One of them is, what books, if any, do you use for identification, or I guess right. now in this world, apps, and do you keep a life list? Oh yes, I keep a life list. I, <laughs> I was uh, my first tutor in birding, um, which is in Morro Bay, California, uh, and I, I spent three months of a sabbatical there, and she took me out, my friend took me out probably three times a week, and then I would go and practice. But um, I use the National Geographic um, Audubon kind of uh, bird. That's that's the book I use. Some people use Peterson's. It's, it's the oldest, really good one. But National Geographic. Um, and uh, I love David Sibley, too. I think okay. David Sibley's work is extraordinary. Um, and I do keep a life list now. Uh, I keep a life list of North American birds and then any country I've been in. Uh, so, because basically birding is a regional, you know, sure, phenomenon, sure. very local. Yep. Uh, if you go somewhere get the most local list of birds, <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, even in a particular area you go to, because that'll be the most specific and it'll narrow down things for you. So you're not, you know, looking for zebra when there's horses and, you know, that, yeah. Um, so, so, you know, there are 10,000 species of birds in the world. I've probably seen 900, I would say. Yeah. And uh, that's from all different, many different countries and, and places. Um, there are 600 and some 40 something in the United, in the North America. I've probably not seen 400 of those quite. So, um, mm -hmm. Yeah, it's uh, so I love having the list, but you know, the list isn't everything. I'm not one of those people who there's a bird alert because you know, Audubon provides bird alerts where you are, you know, and they can go racing to you know, find a bird in some little place. And I've done that a couple of times and been pretty disappointed. <laughs> and so yeah. I generally don't do that. Uh, so I don't even always need my bird book if I'm looking more locally, but um. But if you go somewhere else or somewhere, you always have something. So uh, it just will help you. Um, I, have a, I have one story I want to tell about China, which is um, I went to China about 10 years ago. And I was, you know, I bought a book about birds of China. And there are almost, um, almost a thousand species of birds in China alone. It was a great tour on Olivia, which, you know, a lesbian tour and I was really happy. We had women tour guides and when we went sailing on the Yangtze River I thought you know I'm gonna get to see birds and the guides told me that you know Mao Zedong had said that birds were pests and you should eat them and um, so these guides uh, had really no appreciation of birds and I said if 
yeah. you know, if you have more and more tours from the West, you're going to want to know birds in China, <laughs> you know, become an expert. Um, but we ended up going to Hong Kong and there was a world wildlife uh, refuge in Hong Kong. And I had a friend with me. And so we thought we're going to go there. It's going to take us two trains and a taxi in Hong Kong. We've never been there before to get to this place. But I had coffee with the pastor of the church there called the Blessed Minority Church. It's a LGBT church, but not uh, MCC, but they have MCC connections. And he said, uh, the pastor, Silas, I had coffee with him, and he said, oh, there's a member of our church who um, is an ornithologist. <laughs> so he called her up. I, we met her at the bird sanctuary at the World Wildlife Fund, and she took us on a four-hour amazing tour, the most gorgeous kingfishers I've ever seen in my life. and. And of course, she was from a fundamentalist background. And so she spent about an hour crying about <laughs> her spirituality and being gay and Christian. And uh, so we had tears and prayer and birds and lunch and, <laughs> and uh, worship. And she ended up going to seminary in, uh, in Massachusetts. And she's now doing ministry in Hong Kong and as a lesbian. And so, you know, lesbians and birds and all that, it just it all goes together. Like peanut butter and jelly. Oh, there you go. Um, Nancy, you've got another, when, I, when we were chatting about this, about your evening and what we might talk about, I was struck, it's something I didn't know, about the work around climate change that the yeah. Audubon Society does and that many birders do. Yes. I know you've got a poem about that coming up. Right. So would you like to head there? Sure. So, um, you know, the, there's the, the old saying of canary in the mine. <laughs> well, um, Birds, you know, are one of the great indicators of the way in which the planet is in a crisis or the way things are changing in a particular environment. Um, you know, birds that were living at one level in the mountains in Ecuador are now having to live at higher levels or having to shift or having to move north. And so birds we might never see uh, in the United States, we may start to see at the, at the border and... Um, so um, as I became very convicted around climate change, I, I met the um, head of the Audubon Society uh, who was part of the same climate change group I was in. And I was so excited to meet him. And, um, but he talked about how you know, a, a lot of environmental groups or nature groups, nature conservancy, have, have really had to become more political in the last 10 years and more focused around the politics of climate change, including Audubon. And that's uh, David Yarnold. I don't even know if he's still the president of Audubon. He was. Um, he was head of the Sierra Club, and then he'd never been a birder, and then became head of the Audubon Society. So you had to learn and become a birder in this process. But he, um, it's so important that a lot of these organizations that do so much um, to protect the habitat of birds and to encourage uh, good policy about birds. So groups like Audubon have public policy uh, uh, divisions and, um, and very important work that they do besides just uh, helping to encourage bird watching. So, um, so uh, let's see, I have to move my screen. Can you see so that I can... close enough? I'm, I'm going to... I need to just move, let's see. Okay, so um, learning about birds meant um, learning about the world through new eyes. And I learned about birds that were pelagic, that live out on the ocean, which was just amazing to me to understand that. And, uh, and birds that live at the poles, and there are birds that circumnavigate the poles or who live part-time at either pole, so I came up with the idea that some birds are circumpolar, they travel around, and some are polar biased, meaning they live toward <laughs> one pole or another. And so my polar psalm is just for fun, polar in its composition as well. Whoops. Okay, I have to make that go up. All right. So let's see. We know that you're working with my screen up. technology help. There you go. Oh, no. Oh, I got to do that. Let's see. Okay. <laughs> Here we go. 
Um, I need to open this up and I can't do it. Let's see. Uh, it's because of how it's laid out and I'm not used to it. Okay, nope. Uh, all right. So. Can I help you, Nancy, with something? I'm good, I'm good. You're gonna have to move the poem up as I read it. Is that okay? Okay, th yeah, this is the psalm and then the poem is on the next slide. So I just all love right. the fact that you, um, when you offer, also offered Psalm 139, where can I go from your spirit or where can I flee from your presence? If I take the wings of the morning and settle at the farthest mm. limits of the sea, right. even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me. Right. Yep. Yeah. Okay, so now on to the poem. Yes. Some are circumpolar and some are polar biased, but all their hearts are magnetized to seek the farthest, highest. We were taught to believe they were wastelands devoid of life that mattered, or tests for uh, intrepid frostbit conquerors with something to prove, poking their flagpoles into the ice. Polar birds, lovers of the extremes, you know no land is wasted, and I, I think I know your longing to touch the axis for, I can't read the, it's a little bit for space, space to lay, to lay yeah. your clutch and rest alone, where ice and stars and tundra fill your dreams. And uh, dawn. dawn and sunset forge a queer celestial path. Some are circumpolar and some are polar biased, but all their hearts are magnetized to seek the farthest, highest. <laughs> Thank you so very much. It's beautiful. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Okay, there we go. Okay, I can see everybody now. Dina's, asked, Dina's quizzing you, Nancy. She's wondering if you know which birds circumnavigate. Well, I do think the Arctic turn <clears throat> goes uh, from north to south pole. Uh, I, I'm sure they do. Um, and I've seen Arctic, Arctic terns, but they're the ones I know. And I'm, there, there probably are others. Um, I'm not as aware, but I know Arctic terns do that. So they're also Antarctic terns. <laughs> Antarctic terns, yeah. Yeah, yeah. You've got a couple more pictures here, Nancy. Do you want me to flip to those? Sure. All right. We've got three more total, but if we start with this majestic. Ah. Yes, that's a king vulture. And Costa Rica is a great place. I tell you, if you ever travel anywhere in the world, there's two places. One would be Costa Rica. And my friend who was the, won the big year contest said Malaysia is the other great place for birds. I've never been there. But the king vulture is this gorgeous creature. And I have a, a little story, which is uh, Paula and I were house sitting in Costa Rica for someone who had a home that faced out over the Pacific Ocean, but it was high up in the mountains, just beautiful place. And every night about 30 toucans would nest in the tree right next to the house. It was really just magical. Um, I'd never even heard of a king vulture, but we were traveling uh, very far south, driving in Costa Rica and near the Panama border to a, a botanical gardens. And on the way, in a tree, we saw this vulture. Um, and I thought it was just, I got out of the car, you know, and we, you know, it, it was pretty high up in the tree. But then we came home the next day and we were out on this porch looking out over this view and a huge storm came up. And two of these king vultures came and flew over us for an hour, just wow. like did ballet for an hour. We were just like our mouths were hanging open. We couldn't move. We couldn't go, you know, uh, gorgeous face. Look at that face and, uh, <laughs> and huge wingspan. And they just totally did this ballet. Um, and, uh, you know, I wrote a poem about those two. I'm not sharing that tonight, but they were just um, absolutely magnificent and regal and uh, no, they were called king vultures because vultures are not, you know, birds you think of as attractive or 
you know, they're unusual and kind of prehistoric looking, but this one is really quite amazing and magnificent. So we were very blessed to have that experience. Well, and now we're going to shift to the cutest little birdie. That is <laughs> yeah. also one of your favorites. Look at this beauty. Yeah. The resplendent Quetzal. What a, is that a great name? That's my favorite name for a bird <laughs> of all of them is the resplendent Quetzal. And we had to have a guide take us deep into the forests of Costa Rica. Uh, we stayed overnight at a place and then early the next morning. And we, were, we, ate, we saw three nesting pairs of the Quetzal. And you see how long the male's the tail is. And what was so interesting was the, the males tried to kind of uh, deflect. Uh, one of them, I think, had a nest. And so they really didn't want us to be too near them. And our guide was very respectful. But they're absolutely gorgeous birds with the, the blue and red and green and a little yellow on the top and uh, that amazing tail that's three, four times as long as the body. Um, and just the pride of Costa Rica. Mm. It's yeah. a rainforest bird. <laughs> Beautiful. And I'm wondering if we're getting any more questions. Would anybody else like to ask Nancy anything? Or tell me, or share something about your birding yeah, story. Yeah, exactly. Or where's I the best Mandy and Edie place? have their hand up over there. Go oh. ahead, Mandy and Edie. You got to unmute yourself, my friends. Um, so this, so... This is Queenie the cockatiel. Her door sits open all day long. You don't have to feel sorry. Oh. <laughs> um, oh. So we were on a road trip. Mandy and I put the three teenagers into an RV and we road tripped recently. And somewhere in New Mexico, I think, um, we were on one of those um, on a highway with sort of that bleak. Um, yeah landscape that is that really is enchanting and um you talking about what almost right <laughs> yeah <laughs> well we yeah so we're in the car and um i i love to see birds i do backyard birding and i, I love to see and something started flying toward us even though it was new mexico it was not alien and um <laughs> we, we realized when it was um I don't know, just just past the other side of traffic, this was a um, slightly off-white yellowish owl gliding straight for us back in the middle of the day. I couldn't slam on the brakes. We're driving an RV. The kids would have just <laughs> oh. went to the windshield, so I just had to hold on and not and pray that I didn't hit it and it didn't hit it, us. It was it was really and so. But here's the interesting thing. Aside from, I've never seen an owl in the daytime, and I've never seen an owl in flight like that, um, was one of our first responses was, um, we what is it? We like little girls. <laughs> after, after the screaming, our first reaction was really, what does it mean? Hmm. So, you know, maybe it's because we were in New Mexico, and, you know, you wonder about these things in a, in a place right. where the indigenous people's Father, right. kind of thing. The owl clan. <laughs> I yeah. thought it meant you're idiots for taking three teenagers to Colorado in an RV. Yeah. Right. <laughs> well, you know, raptors are, are often considered messenger birds. Uh, owls, of course, sometimes have an association with death, you know, mm -hmm. um, not always. Um, well, and there are also I, birds that look like owls. There's a goshawk, uh, looks like an owl a lot. But um, you're very sure it was an owl because uh, I'm very sure <laughs> yeah, yeah. it got that owl, close. interesting and unusual to see one like that. It got that day. close, and um, mm. I knew they had snowy owls further south than usual because of the climate change. That seems really far south. I don't know what this. I don't think this was a snowy owl. I I think it was a. Um, I looked it up. Um, not a barn owl. So. But but it looked whiter than what I had looked up. But um, but I was well, just I, I looked it up, and when I saw that there were death associations, I didn't reveal my findings to my travel. <laughs> yeah, good call. Edie. Well, but you know, and out you know, and and how light the an owl is, you know, there's a great variation in coloring. Mm -hmm. So if you're looking at the color in your book, it 
it may not be what's really there right. so yeah how wow yeah it was a while it was a while yeah. i've had that kind of experience with a golden eagle one time or you know and owls are very there's something very um mysterious maybe spiritual is a good word about owls we, we, they're associated with wisdom and i think it's um i think it's to me it's birds in general are very are like you're like you're discussing tonight very spiritual and this this little uh, um experience just kind of drives that home thanks evie yeah. lisa i know you're trying to get in get in line to speak to nancy <laughs> <laughs> No, this is um, this is super exciting. Um, we moved to Virginia, I guess about three, going on four years ago. We've lived in the Baltimore area for about, I don't know, 20 years? And um, 16, I guess 16, 17 years, and never saw a Baltimore Oriole. <laughs> so uh, Bill loves birds. And so we're out here in, uh, Win uh, outside of Winchester, Virginia, almost to West Virginia. Wow. And we have every woodpecker you can imagine bill put some oranges out and we during the migration had baltimore orioles oh. mm. right outside the kitchen window for about five days mm. the most mm. stunning gorgeous uh orange and, and black it was just so yeah. vivid that it was just it's yeah. such a treat so yeah. i just wanted to share that because that that was right. you know you you have to move to virginia to see a baltimore oriole <laughs> Right. Baltimore. We we need we need to have an MCC birding adventure somewhere and <laughs> all gather and uh tell stories. And um you know, they have these birding festivals. I always feel like, oh, there's so many people, I don't know how you get to see the bird, but but it could be fun. There are some great Well speaking yeah. of MCC and birding, I'm thrilled yes. to see Tom Cole on the site tonight because in in nineteen seventy eight we were all camping with MCC Chicago, and <laughs> Tom dragged me out of bed at some ungodly hour to go look at birds. And I don't really remember exactly. We were in the in the dunes in Indiana. <laughs> but what I do remember is that night, Tom also dragged the woman I was dating over to the fire and said, get down on your knees, propose, propose. <laughs> and Darlene did, and we were together 40 years until she passed on. Wow. Oh, years wow. Ago. But uh, Tom was Tom's on tonight, and he was he's he's quite a birder. He's amazing. And yeah. he was, other campouts dragged some of us. You know, walk quietly, sin. Now be quiet. We got to look over here. We got to look over there. Yes. So I I never took to it the way he has, but we mm. we traveled a lot, and I have seen the birds in Malaysia. And my favorite oh, wow. bird memory is being in Tibet and being oh, wow. taken to where the vultures take the bones away of the deceased bodies and it was it was very spiritual sight you could feel it when you walked up to it wow. they were swirling but there were no bodies there that day but they were swirling wow. so that's when i saw the other side of hmm. you know the birds but um yes i've been fortunate to see birds i spent a lot of time in costa rica and other places but uh no birding experience as fun as with Tom Cole. Well, thank you, Cynthia. You know, I will tell you right now that is that continues to this day. When 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 I saw when Nancy had me do the um the King Vulture, Nancy, when I saw that face, yes. first thing I thought of was Tom's chicken book, because Tom <laughs> is a Tom's a lover of chickens, right? And you know you're part of the family when you're at the at the table there, and Tom goes and gets the chicken book, and you look through all the chickens and we have as many different kinds as you can imagine they're all oh. stunning and beautiful so he's he may have landed cynthia okay, on chicken, good, favorite good. Bird. but um <laughs> thank you for that story tom are you there tonight i'm not sure if you're if you're talking tonight or not my friend but we're talking about you so god bless you he's <laughs> muted he's oh. muted and sometimes um sometimes that's challenging there you uh, i'm listening <laughs> Tom, do you have a birding story? Cynthia laid the gauntlet down. Oh, many. <laughs> Ken and I have been birding since 1977. And whenever yes. we go on a vacation, we get uh, run right away to a bookstore and get the local birds yes. of the area and then start watching. 
and mm. we do nature walks we do from our deck from our from our car or whatever i do re remember the once in hawaii nancy you were there <laughs> i had a, a, a hawaiian goose mm. i trained it to come to get fed every afternoon in a house that ken and i rented with my family on the big island of hawaii and that was such a thrill to see that silly thing after i got its attention to come and have uh, whatever i threw out i can't remember i think it was bread and it loved it but, but we continued to bird and we oh, love yeah. it and we have many many birds here yes you do. Uh, at sanctuary yep oh Thanks, yeah Tom. Any other stories? Now, Nancy, oh, yes. go, have Nancy. you ever seen a book called Birds in Bloom? Oh, you mean a mag there's a magazine called Birds in Bloom? It's a magazine, yes. Yeah, I love that. And I, I love always that magazine. Love, yeah, I always love it when they go to Central America and yes. do a really good story on all the birds and especially the hummingbirds. Oh, my yes, goodness. Yes, yes. That's another good reason to go to Costa Rica, hummingbirds. Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, Nancy, you've got one more favorite bird here. I'm going to share oh, yeah. the screen for this little fellow <laughs> that I, I fell in love with. Yeah. How's These are the guy? fairy penguins. <laughs> These are in Tasmania. And uh, Paula and I landed uh, in Tasmania. Uh, this is 2005, it's a long time ago. And it was miserable, raining, cold. And we, we get to where we're staying, but there's a bus that meets us at about nine o'clock at night. It's dark and cold and dreary and ringing and takes us an hour to, the, to be by the uh, seashore. And about 11 o'clock at night, we tromp for about 15 or 20 minutes in the pouring rain <laughs> down to where these little boxes are by the ocean. And you can see all these little fairy penguins coming out of the water there's a little moonlight into these little boxes that children in tasmania make for penguins it's just a way for them to nest uh more comfortably these penguins go out 17 miles or more into the ocean every day and swim all the way back and uh, they fish when they're out there and then they come back and uh nest every night and they're absolutely gorgeous they're the tiniest penguins and I just love their name, Fairy Penguins. That's for you, Tom. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thank you, hon. <laughs> yeah. So that's how you know you're a birder, I guess, if you do things like crazy things like get up at the crack of dawn and be uncomfortable and drive in the dark and, you know, in the rain <laughs> to see Fairy Penguins. <laughs> But it takes you out of yourself, you know, if you, then you're not thinking about work. <laughs> No, and Nancy has um, been wonderful to us. So you can either take a picture of this slide or you mm -hmm. can, um, again, throw your email address into the chat box and we'll gather that. What we normally do at Sanctuary Online is a couple days after, we will send an email and thank you, Nancy, for this to all the right. folks who are on tonight. Right. And we'll go ahead and send all the, all the slides out. Right. Not, not and Sydney, Sydney asked a question, just uh, how do you start if you've never birdwatched? You have a local Audubon Society. They have meetings and they do training for new birders. They do wonderful things like that. And um, they'll have little groups that go out for newcomers. And they'll take you out and you'll get a, get a bird book like a National Geographic or David Sibley's. And uh, also Cornell University. Right has a bird academy and I've, I'm taking a course on warblers from them and uh, they're not too expensive and uh, they're great and you can learn how to identify difficult to identify birds and things. And um, so I can say I went to Cornell. <laughs> <laughs> well, Nancy, any last words, any last stories, any last challenges for us? Yes. Um, obviously. So right. for, for me, birding is about having fun. It's about having fun. Here. Yeah, I just wanted to answer that because there's a really great app called that's put out by Cornell University called um, called Merlin. It's free and it's a great book to help you figure out birds if you're getting started because you can even 
listen to the birds. It gives you the most, re most, most likely ones in your area. And yep. you can take a picture and have it photo identify. Or if you don't have a picture, you can choose different colors and sizes and it'll show you the most recent list. So uh, the Merlin app is, is awesome for people getting started. Um, and again, it's free. And I apologize for interrupting. Please, that's great. Thank you, Ellen. That's wonderful. And the most important thing is, this is something to have fun and relax and enjoy. Uh, and, th and the wonderful thing about birding is that you'll be going along and then suddenly there's a surprise. An owl is flying toward you or, you know, something unusual, a bird you've never seen before. And uh, that's, you know, that's the wonder that connects us to God. Oh, man. man Nancy, I am... Um... I, I know I speak for so many when I say how honored we are to have you here tonight. And just oh, I think what you're doing is great. I love this. I love Sanctuary. Uh, I love all of you. And I'm so thrilled. Uh, you're, you're right on time for what we all need. Well, thank you. And that's, like I said, we, when everything happened, we just said, how do we still be Sanctuary, right? And the answer obviously became Sanctuary Online. <laughs> And what I would love each of you to do, though, the way we end tonight is we always unmute yourselves and do crazy real live applause for Nancy. So, Nancy, thank you so very much. Well, thank you. Together enough to hear Look at that. Look at that. Wonderful to see you guys. Thank you for honoring me and being here. Yeah. Happy birthday, by the way. Yes. Thanks, Nancy. Happy and, birthday. Uh, and thank you so very much. And, and now, Nancy, be giving us a plug here, I want to um, hold the rest of you online for just a moment as we advertise. We have an entire um, layout of August for everyone, and we're sending this out, hopefully, to any churches or any book clubs or families. Um, August is going to be quite fun. It is August, right? So we're going to start next week um, with Zoom 201. A, co a couple weeks ago, Cheryl did Zoom 101 for participants to help us learn how to navigate Zoom better, whether you're using phones or iPads or laptops. Um, this go Zoom is gonna be for hosts and presenters. So you don't have to be listening or anything like that, but if you would like to learn how to help folks, even if it's family meetings or book clubs or card groups, I know there's loads of things like that. Um, I'll be doing a Zoom 201 next week and that will help you just some cool tricks. Um, I do dance parties and you can figure out how to spotlight different things as well as um, some tricks around breakout rooms and even screen sharing. Just some, some nice tricks and trips. I promise to make you a diva overnight, okay, with your, with your Zoom skills. And then the very next day, August 5th, is our last date available for our pets. We're having a pet photo contest and pet trick video contest on August 11th. So any trick. So Edie, if that bird does weird tricks or uh, <laughs> Dina, you had a kitty cat in there a little while ago, um, anything at all. We're also going to have some folks hosting that night who do great work in shelters. And they're going to give us um, ideas of what they've done as for a nonprofit they've developed for, for animals and also how COVID is affecting shelters and our animals and um they'll be on their hosting on august 11th oh. and august 12th is your last night to send photos and stories and recipes as we go camping i know many of you are hoping to go to be sanctuary we're we start out as sanctuary in the woods we've gone to be sanctuary at sea we're now sanctuary online and we were planning this august to be outside of um Arkansas when to be sanctuary on the road. We had a, a whole campsite um, reserved and we were all excited for that. And like everything else with COVID, that has changed. So we are now going to camp online. Okay, and I have another detail about that in just a minute, but we're gonna have some serious fun. Um, I do want to notice though, on August 25th, Ken's gonna be feeling well enough to be um, our featured author of the month of August. And so you can go to Ken's book, Ken's website, which is just www.revkenmartin.com. Ask him for a signed copy. He'll get that out in the mail to you quickly. And you can have that book read by the time we, um, we interview Ken on August 25th. So I know it, it's crazy. We have so much going on here. There's my Zoom class. Look at that, two screens, iPads and loads of stuff. I can help you out with that. 
Um, here's our pet photos. So we're looking for the cutest pet costume. We're looking for the pet that lives the furthest from sanctuary, the smallest pet, the largest pet, the most exotic pet, the pet with only a face only a mother could love or pet parent. Um, a look-alike photo, if you look like your pet, and get that in. Um, we're gonna take videos for best pet tricks um, and then an overall best pet picture. So please think about that. You've got about a week to go through your photos. I know you have some fantastic photos out there. Um, and then we're going camping. So what's happened is we're merging Sanctuary Online and Sanctuary on the Road to create Sanctuary on the Road Online. All right, so you gotta just hang with us, right? What, what else is there to do in August? Come on. So Tuesday, August 18th, we're gonna get to know each other. Wednesday, we have best camp foods and recipes. We hope that you'll send recipes in that we can share. And then um, on Thursday, I think, Cheryl, you're breaking out the guitar, right? We're going to have some songs and stories around the campfire. Here's, someone okay. said, I'm not a camper. Yeah. And I said, look at this. This is my mother's backyard. Yes, you can be a camper, okay? You can camp on your deck. You can camp in your doggone living room. You can camp in a campsite. You can go to the, we don't care. It's online. Just take some pictures, have some fun. We got a little camping I don't know, fire pit thing here. All good to go, all right? And finally, we'll send you out the details shortly. The photo contests for the 18th are best decorated campsite, funniest camping picture, and best pet camper. So no need to go make new pictures. I'm sure you have great pictures of the times that you've camped. Wednesday's all about food. We want your favorite recipe, your best camping dinner, your best fishing photo, because fish are food for some people. Um, and then Thursday, it is all about special entertainment. So we're gonna have songs and stories and the photo contests are for best campfire and the most beautiful campground that you ever had in the mountains or on the water. Are you gonna come? Hey, come good. on, you okay? I'm excited about this and I have one more slide, God bless. This is Ken. Once again, we are so excited that Ken is healthy enough. Ken was supposed to be one of our first presenters in March and just hasn't had breath in his lungs to be able to last for even an hour. And so he believes by the end of next month, he'll be able to be here and, um, and be interviewed from his phenomenal work around relationships. My friends, it's 9.02 and it's been a very full night, at least for me, up here in my Aww, childhood bedroom. Man, <laughs> Nancy, thank you again so thank very, you. very, very much. Uh, more applause, more chatting. Thank Unmute you. yourself. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> thank all thank you. you, Nancy. Thank you. We're here every Tuesday yeah. night. Come on Good back. All right. God bless thank you all. Nancy. Thanks so much. Good to see you. A lot of you new folks. Susan and Joan, Bye. Ellen, Dina. Great to see you all. Melanie and Katie. Good to see you. Trying to see who was on here first. Jennifer and Lori, so good to see you. I miss golfing with you all. <laughs> Glenda, welcome to Sanctuary Online and at MCC Toronto. So please keep joining in. Kay and Becky and Mary and the Bonnies, Cynthia, Mary Beth and Jan. Good to see all y'all. Bye. Good guys. Hi. Good night. Night night. Bye, you night you night. You too, Dr. Dale. Have a good Thanks, evening, y'all. Good to see y'all. Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night. Night, Barb. All right, I am saving the chat, Barb. We're all good to go. Hey, ladies. Good to see you. And bye, Deb and Deb. Bye, Bonnie. I'm going to stop the recording. And I hope y'all come back next week and for some camping and for some great pet pictures. <laughs>